Uh, why Israel? It's probably one of the most contentious, polarizing issues in the world right now. And uh, I thought we should talk about it. And I just want to say there's so much to cover and so much to talk about. We're only going to get a little snapshot, a bit of an overview today, and uh, hopefully it'll be helpful. So uh, <clears throat> let's go. Lately, as you know, every day, Israel is in the news, many times a day, on every news channel, doesn't matter which one you go to, there's always something about what's happening in Gaza. The Israeli assault on Gaza has been going on now for almost seven months, since the 8th of October. And uh, there's daily news items, very graphic pictures of dead and wounded, including women and children, uh, particularly in Gaza. Even aid workers and news reporters have been killed. Hospitals, schools and mosques have been bombed. And so far, Apparently, approximately 34,000 people have been killed in Gaza over the last seven months, and it's not over yet. Now, we've got a map uh, we'll put up there of uh, the land of Israel, which shows Gaza. Now, you see that map there, <coughs> which shows Israel. Gaza is that little strip of land along the Mediterranean coast there. It's 41 kilometres long, 6 to 12 kilometres wide, and uh, a total area of 365 kilometres, square kilometres. Uh, that's the area in that little bit of the corner of the map there. And over 2 million people live there. One of the most densely populated areas on Earth. Over the past six to seven months, Israel's uh, military operation uh, bombing that little strip of land has been ongoing. And so have the protests all around the world, as we know, and uh, most recently even in the American universities, and there's been riots and all sorts of stuff. Uh, here in New Zealand, there's been protests as well, and there's been ongoing United Nations resolutions condemning Israel and it really seems like <clears throat> the whole world is upset about what's happening here. And um, when you stop to think about it, surely anyone with any care or compassion for those innocent people caught up in this should be concerned. And we should be concerned. I mean, there's no question about that because, um, you know, there are innocent people dying every day. And there's, there's uh, the Palestinian people that live in Gaza, there's quite a number of Christian people, there's all sorts of different uh, people that live there. And so, uh, as well as praying for Israel, as we have done and will continue to do, we also need to pray for and remember the innocent people, the innocent victims on all sides, but including those in Gaza right now, because they're, they're really under the pump. There's no question about it. But today I want to give us a little bit of context and a brief history of how this all came about because sometimes we can look at a situation that's happening right now and we can have, uh, you know, come to some very uh, definite conclusions and get all angry about it and upset about it, but if we know the whole story in the background, it actually helps us to pray more effectively and have more of an understanding. So that's my hope today, is that we will have a, a better understanding of what's actually going on there and why it's going on. Why is all this terrible stuff happening? Uh, just so for a bit of context and a brief history, in AD 70, that was about... Uh, 30, 35 years after Jesus had died and was resurrected and then ascended back into heaven. Um, Jesus, before he went, he predicted, because he was out there walking around Jerusalem with his disciples, and um, he, they were admiring the temple, and they were saying what a beautiful building it was and how amazing it was. And Jesus w uh, said that, look, guys, that one day there's not going to be one stone left upon another in this beautiful building, the temple. 
And uh, in AD 70, the Romans went through and they destroyed Jerusalem, including the temple. And Jesus' prophecy about the temple was literally fulfilled. There's only the foundations left, the western wall and the the big uh, foundation there, the Temple Mount is still there. It's interesting, there's a Muslim mosque on the top of it. But uh, the nation of Israel at that point ceased to exist. And the Jewish people were scattered all over the world. And for almost 2,000 years, that land that had formerly been Israel, it was was Palestine, known as Palestine, became uh, more of a wasteland. People did live there, people, they were... Uh, Bedouin people, there were different nationalities of people, there were was, was some Palestinians, there were some Jews that still lived there, there was a mixture of people, but it re- effectively, instead of being a beautiful country, it was really a bit of a wasteland, that's how the Romans left it, and it was interesting, in 1867, Mark Twain visited Palestine and was shocked by what he saw, because he'd heard all about Israel and the Bible and, and, and all the, the stories just as we, we know. And this is what he said. He described the land of Palestine as being desolate and unlovely, lying in sackcloth and ashes, uninhabited only by b- birds and of prey and foxes. And he described Jerusalem was just like a tiny village. There's a few people lived there. But it wasn't this great city that it had been, particularly under David and the the uh, the highlight of the, you know the the great history of the Jewish people had had all gone. However, during the First World War, a shift started to happen, and um, it wasn't that long ago. In terms of the last two thousand years, the Allies, including the Anzacs after being defeated at Gallipoli and then just a week or two ago, we remembered the Anzac sacrifice where 3,000 Kiwis died in that almost 3,000 in that that Gallipoli Peninsula uh, fighting against the Ottoman Turks. But hello, a year or two later, the, the Anzacs and the Allies were also fighting in Palestine. And they were based in Egypt, and they they went through, and they actually, the the Anzacs, the the Kiwis and Australians, had a pivotal role in freeing Palestine from 402 years of Ottoman rule. The Turks had run that that country, that area, for a long, long time. And when we were in Israel, there's actually, uh, in Beersheba, there's a plaque to the Anzacs because the cavalry, the horsemen from New Zealand, played such a critical role in freeing uh, Palestine from the Ottoman Turks who had, you know, they'd been defeated by them a year or two earlier at Gallipoli and here we are a year or two later, some of the same people were there fighting on behalf of the Allies and freeing that area from uh, (coughs) what had been Muslim rule for over 400 years. Something that we don't know much about or celebrate very often, but it's something we need to remember. It's a part of our history. Um, So Palestine, from about 1918, instead of being governed by the Ottoman Turks, was governed by the British. And then if you fast forward about 24 years to the Second World War, uh, immediately... Oh, in the Second World War, as we know, there were about six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust during the Second World War. But immediately after the war, on the 14th of May, 1948, the United Nations formally recognised the State of Israel as a sovereign country for the first time in two th- approximately 2,000 years. And I think part of that was a realisation and a sense of guilt about what had happened to the Jews through the, the Holocaust, with so many millions of them had been gassed and killed and all the rest of it. And uh, there was a sense that, oh, that, this was wrong, and uh, we need to help these people And uh, so the state of Israel was formed officially and legally by the United Nations on the 14th of May, 1948. And it looked like, and and the the Jews started coming back there. They had the beginnings of a a very small nation. They had a tiny army and uh, just the beginnings of something that held a lot of promise. 
However, we'll look at map two uh, in the Middle East. Immediately, even though the Jews, had, some of them had gone back and uh, had their own homeland again, immediately after that United Nations resolution on the 14th of May 1948, all the surrounding Arab nations were not happy with that resolution. And immediately they attacked Israel from day one. And their intention was to drive them into the sea. And uh, if you look at that map there, you can see the countries around about. That's all the Middle East region, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Miraculously, with a tiny, untrained military and only just getting themselves established, Israel managed to defend themselves, and, they, and, and, and actually they gained more ground and, and, uh, from day one even though they, did, they only had such a small army and they didn't have everyone else in the world supporting them. It was a miracle from God that they survived past day one. <clears throat> Ever since, there have been regular attacks and wars every few years. And uh, you know, the, one of the most notable ones was that one in 1948, and it was actually Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria all attacked at once, and that's there all around. If you look at that map there, there's Egypt, Le Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. They're all around, immediately around Israel. They all attacked, and then <coughs> they, they were beaten. 1967 was another major war, the Six-Day War, where Egypt, Syria, and Jordan decided they were going to attack Israel again. And they were amassing in the Sinai Desert, just down in the north of Egypt there. Their, their armies were gathering there, and uh, Israel saw what was happening, and they, they actually uh, did a surprise attack, Israel did, on, and wiped out their air force in one day, in uh, Syria and in uh, one of those, uh, Jordan, I think. <clears throat> so, and that, that six-day war, it was only a six days and Israel, once again, they defeated this coalition of um, Arab nations that were coming against them. That wasn't the end of it. There, were, there was another one in every few years. 1973 was another significant war. I'm only covering the highlights. The Yom Kippur War, war was an Arab coalition once more launched a surprise attack. And uh, this time Israel responded. And actually, this was a little bit of a dodgy one. I was reading about this. There was Israel at one point was uh, on the back foot, and uh, the Prime Minister was Golda Meir at the time, and she actually said to the military, get, get your nukes ready, we're getting beaten here. But miraculously, they managed to survive that one because at the last minute, America came in and helped them. And uh, so that was, that was quite a... A surprise, really. I think they were concerned about the possibility of some nuclear stuff happening in the, in the Middle East. <clears throat> and after that war, Israel took more territory again. They gained the Golan Heights, and they took the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt all the way to the Suez Canal. So Israel was, was in control of that whole area. In the meantime, they've been, been negotiating back and given bits back to Egypt and different ones, but they've managed to hang on to control of the Golan Heights because it's such a critical area because it overlooks um, Israel and if they, can, if they gave that back they'd make themselves very vulnerable. Then of course in 1982 it was the Lebanon War <coughs> which was, uh, that was quite a big war as well. So every few years they've been attacked ever since they were established as a nation. All, all the way in between there's been smaller incursions, there's been almost monthly terrorist attacks against them, and, um, <clears throat> which we've, we've heard about over the years. Seven months ago, Hamas attacked Israel from Gaza, from that little strip of land that we mentioned. That, that picture there, by the way, of that's Israel with the, with the little black bit around it, but that includes the Palestinian areas of Gaza and the West Bank, and so that is actually a bigger um, picture of Israel than that's the because it, it includes the Palestinian areas as well. Anyway, on, earlier on the morning of the 7th of October last year, 
Hamas fired between 2,500 and 3,000 rockets at Israel. The Hamas militants, this was the background to what's happening right now. Hamas militants it broke through and they attacked and killed 1,163 Israelis, mostly civilians, including 38 children. And they took 253 hostages back into Gaza. This was obviously was a well-planned surprise attack. Israel was completely caught out by this. And uh, early <coughs> in the war, Israel estimated that underneath um, the area of Gaza, there was about 300 kilometres of tunnels. That's what they thought was there. But since, uh, as the war has progressed, they now estimate that there are over 500 kilometres of tunnels that have been dug under that little wee narrow strip of land underneath Gaza. So really what they have built there is an underground military stronghold underneath that area. If you think about, just briefly, let's just think about the work involved in doing what they've done there. They, they dug, not only did they dig, dig all those tunnels and areas, they had to be reinforced with concrete, which meant truckloads, thousands of truckloads of concrete have gone into those tunnels and steel reinforcing. And uh, they've also ins had to install ventilation shafts because they have to be able to breathe under there you know, for 500 kilometres, and then they also would have had to have lights and, and places. There was years of work that went on there. If you start to think about the years and, and the effort and the expense that's gone into building that uh, underground military stronghold, um, it makes you realise that these guys have been planning something for a while. On top of that, they have amassed thousands of rockets through the period, uh, there's about a 10 year period there, they estimate that uh, Gaza has, has fired over 20,000 rockets towards Israel. And 3,000, two and a half, 3,000 just on that 7th of October last year. And they, to fire rockets, they need rocket launchers. And often those rocket launchers have been set up in public spaces. And I guess you could say it's so crowded they haven't got much choice, but they don't have to put them in hospitals, schools and mosques, which they have done. Clearly, there's been a, a well-planned, well-thought-through operation that's been happening there before the surprise attack happened on the 7th of October. Just how many Hamas militants there are, nobody quite knows. Uh, because they're hiding underground and they're also living and operating amongst the civilian population. Israel estimated 30,000 Hamas militants. The CIA estimates 40,000. But it's not... <coughs> we need to understand it's not just Hamas that's been attacking Israel. We've got another map there um, which shows... This, these are the, the people that have been attacking Israel specifically since the 7th of October. We have Hamas there, that little arrow on the left. We have Hezbollah uh, in the north. That's coming from Lebanon. We also have the Houthis down here in Yemen. And they have, they have uh, been primarily attacking the shipping that goes through the Red Sea. But they've also been, uh, they've got some long-range rockets. They've also been firing some at Israel as well. And actually, just as a side note, with the, uh, with the Houthis down there, uh, John Blewett tells me that we're paying, uh, us dairy farmers pay, are getting 20 cents a kilo less for our milk because all the shipping, has, instead of going through the Red Sea, has to go way around the south, uh, southern Africa. So it's costing the whole world, actually, what's happening there. Um, and then, of course, three weeks ago, we had Iran firing rockets as well. And uh, Iran fired over 300 drones, rockets and missiles at, at Israel as well. It was a simultaneous attack. They were all timed to arrive at the same time so that they would be over, their air defences would be overwhelmed. <coughs> so it's all very interesting, isn't it? Iran is actually the main player in all of this, from a political, military point of view. They are the ones who have been supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis. 
And actually, interestingly enough, you know, and all of these areas have been areas of unrest for years. The Houthis, in fact, down in Yemen, um, there's been four million people displaced because of these Hout, uh, Houthis operating down there, trying to take over. And there's been 160,000 people killed over the last 10 years or so, but hardly anyone really seems to worry about it too much. And it's been the similar in Lebanon. I mean, we know what's been happening in Iraq. We also know what's ha been happening in Syria. The Kurdish people have been, uh, you know, they've been attack under attack for years. And so there's all this unrest over the whole of the Middle East. And part of the problem is because there's two branches of Islam. There's the Shia Mus Muslims, which is Iran, and they are the ones that are supporting these terrorist groups. And then there's the Su Sunni or Sunni Muslim. That, uh, and so they don't quite get along, although they pretty much believe the same thing. And then, of course, there's little old Israel stuck in the middle. <clears throat> the other thing about Iran being the main player in this. I, I believe there's one bigger player in this that we're going to talk about shortly, but Iran has been working to develop nuclear weapons now for years. It's been in the news all the way through, and the, the International Atomic Agency have been watching, they've been checking, they've been, and they have come out and said that they believe that Iran could could manufacture nuclear missiles, warheads, within a few days. They're at that stage right now. If they chose to, they could, uh, they could get all these nuclear missiles and they could potentially arm these militants and who knows what would happen from there <clears throat> in a matter of days. So I think we need to understand this whole thing is not over yet. And then the big question, will Israel invade Rafa as well, where there's all these people sheltering and uh, vulnerable, and the Hamas militants are hiding under there, and they want to get them and, and, and do away with them, but there's all the civilian population living over the top of them and amongst them. So it's a tricky situation. The other one, have you heard chants at protests where they say, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free? Have you heard that? What does that mean? What that means is from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, there will no longer be any more Jews. What they're saying is that they want to wipe out the nation of Israel. That's, what, that's been their intention right from 1948 with the Arab coalition. They were going to drive them into the sea and do away with them. And uh, <clears throat> so we need to understand that there's a real hatred and a determination amongst the, the Arab nations and particularly the, the Palestinians as well to destroy Israel. We'll have, an, have a, another one with a world map on there now. And if you look at Israel in terms of the world, you can see that circle there. That's simply so that we can ide identify where Israel is. Israel is the little dot in the middle of the circle. We need to understand, I mean, New Zealand is pretty small, right? We're a fairly small nation. New Zealand is apparently 267,000 square kilometres. That's how big New Zealand is. Down, right down the bottom of the corner of the world there, we're pretty small and insignificant. But Israel is actually only 22,000 square kilometres, less than 10% of the size of New Zealand. We're only talking about a dot on the map. Incredible, really, isn't it? It's such a tiny little place it's smaller than the Waikato. Waikato is 25,000 square kilometres and Israel is 22. It's smaller than the Waikato. And yet, I mean, it, when it comes to the news, New Zealand in the world news, New Zealand probably hardly ever gets a mention, and yet Israel is in the news every day. So what's going on? There must be something going on. In, co in comparison, we might go back, to, if we can go back, team back to the Middle East uh, uh, map. <clears throat> There's a vast area around Israel. There's Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Omar, Oman, Yam Yemen, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, and Jordan. And they're all around about, and actually Saudi Arabia is a pretty big country there, but that's uh, 
over 100 times bigger than Israel. 20, uh, I can't remember now, is it 200 million square kilometres or 2 million square kilometres? There's a huge area around about there, and uh, Israel is so tiny and insignificant, and yet they, and they could easily just forget about it and move on with their lives, but they just seems to be uh, that they can't. And they just want to get, uh, get, get rid of it. They all seem to be really threatened by the presence of a tiny little nation in their midst. So why is it? We need to go right back to the beginning to get a little bit of a perspective on this. <clears throat> right back in the beginning, where, where God hinted at his plan to restore the relationship that had been lost because of Adam and Eve's sin. Right back to the garden. Genesis 3, verse 15, God said to the serpent, the devil, who had tricked Eve and, and Adam regarding the seed of the woman, the offspring of Eve. He said, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. From then on, I think the devil has been looking out for the he, the mystery who is going to crush his head. I mean, if, if God said to any one of us that someone's going to come along that's going to crush our head, you'd be... A little bit concerned, wouldn't you? I mean, no one wants to have their head crushed. And uh, I think that's been the beginning of all of this. And a couple of thousand years went by and nothing much, and the devil was watching and looking and trying to figure out who, what was going to come and how he was going to get his head crushed, and nothing much happened. And, um, you know, we, I think we're always in a rush. But God is never in a rush. He waited 2,000 years. And then he, he looked and he said, there's, I think there's a man I can trust with the plan. And his name, name was Abram. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. This is what God said to Abram, by the way, was known as a man of faith and a man of trust, but he's also known as a friend of God. God had a friend that he could trust. That's what God's always looking for people that he can trust. And Abram wasn't perfect. He didn't get it all right. He made some bad mistakes, but he always trusted God. And he was always like a friend to God. And, and if, if God told him something, he believed it. This is what God said to him. Abram, mate... I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. At this stage, Abram was getting on, just him and Sarah and they had no kids and God was talking about a promise of a great nation to come from them. And we know the story. And of course the problem was that they were almost past even having kids, one child, let alone a nation. So they decided to help God out a bit. And they had a son by Sarah's slave girl, Hagar. Back then, a slave was your property. So the boy Ishmael was their son, right? That was their thinking. Wrong. When God said something, he meant what he said, because he always does. And miraculously, when Sarah was 90 and Abraham was 100, Isaac was born. And as the two boys grew, Ishmael and Isaac, there was jealousy and rivalry between the two mothers, between Hagar and Sarah. And later, that jealousy and rivalry transferred down to the two, two boys, Ishmael and Isaac. And it was never dealt with. Abram, for all his faith and his friendship with God, he never dealt with a problem right at the heart of his family, and he allowed it to continue and to continue 
And it just got worse and it got worse and it got worse. And now 4,000 years later, it's all out war between Israel, who are the descendants from Abraham through Isaac, and the Palestinian Arabs who descended from Abraham through Ishmael. On both sides, they claim to be descendants of Abraham. And it's interesting, according to uh, Mr. Google, they've done recent DNA tests on the Jews and the Palestinians, and they've found that they've got a very, they're very closely related, and they, they must have a common ancestry. That's what the DNA experts have worked out. But over and above all of this, in the background, all the way through, there's been something bigger going on. It's the devil, the serpent, has been trying to figure out all the way who the he is that's going to crush his head. He's been doing his best to find him, to disrupt God's plans, to kill him and destroy him before he gets destroyed himself. So that is why Abraham's family, Israel, have and continue to be such a target because he's figured out it's something to do with that family. And God's plan of redemption and bringing back everything as it was and should be involves crushing the serpent's head. <clears throat> and that's why Israel is at the center of all this. So what should our relationship with Israel be today? The Apostle Paul, we could, we could, like I said, I could talk about this for hours, but I'm going to quickly go through this. The Apostle Paul summed it up like this, Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. The people of Israel, he's talking about the Jews, the people that lived in the land, the people that are back in the land. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. They were sons and daughters of Abram. There's the divine glory, the covenants. The covenants are the promises. All the promises in the Word of God were originally given to them about the future, the receiving of the law, which was through Moses, the temple worship. You know, David had on his heart to build a temple. It was Solomon that built the first one. And the promises. These are the patriarchs, the spiritual fathers. He's talking about people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and all those champions that have gone before. They belong to the, the Jewish Abraham's family. And from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. God's Son, Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, was born a Jew. Born into Abram's family. That's why they have all those, that's why all those genealogies are in the Bible. You know, sometimes we read it all and say, oh, what's all this about? We don't need all this stuff. But actually helps us to understand the history and the family lineage and how, it, how it's gone down and the value of uh, of what we as have, have received and where it's come from. Jesus was born into Abraham's family, but the Jews didn't recognize him by and large, and they rejected him. They did not understand who he was. Romans Chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul goes on talking. And so there's all these chapters of 9, 10, 11, 12. It's all where Paul is discussing with the Roman in his, Romans in his letter about the place of Israel, the value of them in history and their struggles that they've had and, uh, and why we should stand with them. And this is what he says. Again, I ask, did they stumble, that's the Jews, so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, which is us, to make Israel envious. God still wants his people to love him and understand who their Messiah really is. And we are prospering and blessed as 
Word of God says to actually cause them to think, oh, maybe we're missing out. And we continue on in Romans uh, verse 11, but if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? The Jews and the people of Israel, it's clear in the Bible, will have their eyes opened one day. It's starting to happen. But most of if you went to Israel today when we were there, if you, they, they still are under the law, they're under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. They do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, as we do. They're missing out on all of that. But the time is coming when their eyes will be opened. They will be fully included once again. And we're told that in the last days, which could be any time now, they will have a revelation of who Jesus is. The Messiah, of who he is. The he that God talked about right back in the garden. Romans 11, verses 17 and 18. Paul's continuing this discussion in his letter. If some of the branches have been broken off, speaking about the Jews, and if you, though a wild olive shoot, speaking about the Gentiles, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. The olive tree was always a picture of Israel. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, Consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Who is the root that we f stand on? It's the people of Israel. It's the, it's the Bible. It's the Word of God. It's, it's all the history and the promises in Jesus himself. <clears throat> we have been blessed by Israel in so many ways. Even, and interestingly, even their unbelief and rejection of Jesus blessed us because it opened it up for anyone and everyone who wants to receive salvation, like what um, um, Kathy was talking about in communion this morning. As believers in Jesus, we are adopted into Abraham's family. We are grafted in to the family. The Jews, that, that means the Jew, Jewish people are our brothers and sisters, right? If you're adopted into a family, they become part of your whānau. They are brothers and sisters. They are natural family and we're the adopted ones. And as family, you know, as we know, we don't always agree on everything, but you know, I, when the chips are down, we should stick up for each other, shouldn't we? I mean, they, the Jews and the Palestinians are actually family as well. But that's, what's, what's happened, that rift has caused such a hatred and division. And, and as family, we need to, as God's family, we need to do better than the Palestinians have done. We need to realize the blessings that we've received through them and stick together with them in their time of need. Genesis 12 verse 3, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. That's a promise that has never been retracted. Abraham's family, if we bless them, we will be blessed. And if we curse them, we will be cursed. I don't know about you guys, but I want God's blessing. Life can be tough enough. But imagine if we've got God against us. We need God for us, not against us. Psalm of David, Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends... I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord your God, I will seek your prosperity. And I want to say that God's people, the church, have not always been supportive of Jerusalem, the Jews, or Israel through the centuries. There's been a whole lot of talk around replacement theology. 
which you know, we're probably not even aware what that means, but it really means that uh, the Christian believers have replaced Israel and God's done away with them. They've got no future in his plans at all. It's, now it's all about us and the church, which is not true. And I think people started to think like that because they, they knew the prophecies about Israel in the Bible, but they thought, oh, it's, it hasn't happened. You know, a few hundred years have gone by, a couple of thousand years almost, and they started to think, oh, it's not going to happen, so really it must be us now. It must be the church. But they were wrong. The idea that we have replaced Israel is wrong. It's clear in Romans that we are simply adopted in, grafted in, and that's different to replacing them. And the church was largely silent through the Holocaust as well. When Nazi Germany and uh, people that were with them were gassing and murdering and killing six million Jews, the church didn't say much about it. And the church was strong in Europe. The church has let them down. And now as you and I, the church, today, see what is happening and getting nearer to the end, I want to suggest that we, we need to be on the right side of history with this. In fact, we should be taking intelligent interest in what's happening every day. We should be watching and waiting because it's a sign that actually things are moving. And that little dot... God sees that little dot as the centre of the world. Israel being back in the land is an absolute miracle and a fulfilment of prophecy. After almost 2,000 years, a nation has been reborn. People have returned from all over the earth. A nation that has survived and is now largely flourishing against all odds. A national language, Hebrew, that had not been spoken for all those years, 2,000 years, it's now it's the national language they speak it, and their culture is being revived. Israel, that tiny dot on the world map, is now in the news every day. And when Jesus returned to heaven, he left from the Mount of Olives, which is just outside Jerusalem. We saw that when we were there. And, and he said that he will return to that exact same place. And in a very similar way, physically, he's going to return. And literally, he's going to return, not some spiritual figurative thing. And he will rule the world from Jerusalem. That's what the Word of God tells us. We've got, a, we've got a map, a final map that I want to show you guys. That's it there. And let's think about that little dot of Israel and all the blessing that's come down through there. And those lines going out, they're not missiles going out like the ones coming in. They are the blessing of God going out from that nation. And, and the, uh, the church began in Jerusalem with the apostles in, in the day of Pentecost. And as was prophesied, they went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth. And we sit here today, right that little bit right down the bottom, because of what God has been doing through history in Israel. And when Jesus returns, he's going to return to there again, and the whole world will be blessed with his government and the righteousness and the leadership that we're going to see. That there will be peace. And there's that bit that the United Nations, you know, the swords will be, be beaten into plowshares and, and man will learn war no more. There's going to be peace coming for everybody. And even the people, that, the Palestinians and the Arabs, and there's, there's the prophecies that they're going to come to a, into a revelation of understanding who the he is as well. There's going to become a unity uh, right across the world when Jesus is revealed, and it's, it's gonna, some of it's going to happen sooner. I believe it's really it's a spiritual battle that's been going on 
for the last 4,000 years, and, and there's a, it's a spirit of antichrist that's actually at work coming against the plan of God. And we need to be careful that we're not feeding into that. We need to stand against it and we need to be praying intelligently. And, we, and of course, we support uh, innocent people that get caught up in it. That, uh, but that's not their own fault. So anyway, that's what this is all about. It's about the he. Jesus is the one that this is all about. And um, the devil is very uncomfortable about the he. And so he's stirring up as much problems as he can. So then Peace. Flowing like a gentle river Righteousness Rolling over you like waves In the sea Rolling over your 